What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders uh, like the founders of uh, RX Bars. They end up selling to Kellogg for $600 million, but they talked about the early days that weren't so easy. And uh, P90X founder Tony Horton talked about how he made, you know, this is interesting, Mitch. He made money as a street mime. Like the way he made food and rent money was he would put his hat on the street and do street miming to make his money before he obviously went on and sold hundreds of millions of dollars in P90X. Um, Atari founder, Nolan Bushnell, <laughs> talked about how he was Steve Jobs' mentor and Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no and cool. many, many more. So check out the interviews in spiritinsider.com. Uh, the episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And at Rise25, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And basically what that does, it creates a systemized incoming referral pipeline that creates ROI. And this is using a podcast. For me, podcasting is much more personal. Um, it's not about just about your business. It's about leaving a legacy for yourself and your guests like we are today because it was inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were in concentration camps in Nazi Germany. We're the only people to survive. And his words and legacy live on because of an interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him, which you can watch on my about page. So yes, podcasting will help your business. And I think every business should have a podcast period, but it also helps you leave a legacy and your guests leave a legacy. So if you have questions, you could email us and go to rise25.com or support at rise25media.com. I am super excited today um, to introduce Mitch Kahn. Um, Mitch co-founded Grassroots Cannabis in 2014. Through his leadership as CEO, the company has grown to have 61 licenses and operations in 11 states with more than 800 employees. When I checked the stats, I think yesterday, Mitch, you like doubled in size from yesterday to today. It's like I had to, to fact check this because they've grown so quickly just in the past year. And um, Cureleaf, which is a Massachusetts-based company, signed a merger agreement with Grassroots Cannabis for $875 million in stock and cash. And the deal will make the company at the time, you know, the largest medical and adult use cannabis company. Uh, Mitch, thank you for, for joining me. Oh, my pleasure, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Uh, you have a crazy, crazy schedule. You're up late. You're up early. Um, I want you just to give people a sense of, you know, we were talking a little before we hit record on you started with three stores. Now you're at what? You started with certain grow facilities. Now you're at what? What? You know, give us just a quick um, where you were and where you are now. So, so this started. You know, to say it started as a lark would be a bit of an over, you know, over dramatization. But we really started this um, as an opportunity. We saw real opportunity to um, to be involved in an entire industry from the ground floor. So my partner and I. Uh, applied for originally three, you know, five licenses here in Illinois. We won three of them. So we started in, uh, we applied and, you know, started the company in 2014, opened our first three stores in early 2016. And since early 2016 and, you know, literally three and a half years, we have, um, you know, we have grown to, as you said, 61 licenses, 11 states, 800 employees. Wow. Um, you know, we're, we are the largest private cannabis company in the country today and about to, uh, about to hopefully uh, complete a merger with Cureleaf, which will make us, they, they are the largest pu public company in the space. So we will be the largest company yeah. by far. And, uh, you know, we're excited about that. You know, so it, it almost seems obvious to some people now, but when you started, it wasn't so obvious. How hard was it to get the licenses and what did you have to go through to, to start? Well, you know, every state and we've, what's different about the way we've done is we did it mostly through organic growth. So we applied and won in competitive applications, two thirds of our, of our licenses, the rest we bought. Most of the other large companies have done it the other way. They found you know, very well-heeled investors and bought a bunch of stuff later on. So, uh, you know, I think it was it was certainly hard and very competitive, um, but I think it allowed us to grow in a much more logical, organic way without worrying about having to, to integrate every time we bought a bunch of different things. But it was, it was, as you said, it was not 
quite as uh, commonplace as, as it is today. You know, today, pe people, I mean, er everywhere you go, people are talking about it. Illinois, as you know, is going uh, live with a recreational program January 1st. Um, so it's, it's top of mind ev everywhere. In 2014, when we started, and even 16, when we started the first stores, it was still, you know, for many, kind of a dirty little secret. It was just not something people wanted to talk much about. You know, I've heard you speak, and I encourage anyone who check out, you know, your talks that you've given online, but you say, you know, there's so many challenges, and we talked before, uh, and you said there's an alligator pool. You don't know who's going to come up and, and bite and drag, drag you. There's always a challenge every day, but the hardest part about the growing the business, I know you've talked about, is the people, and the people, you know, it's to have a good team that's running it. And so I'm wondering from early on when you had three stores, what did the, the company look like? Who are the people helping run the show? Well, you know, one of the real challenges in this business is the people. And, and truth be told, from my perspective, it's the single most important thing in any business for anybody, no matter how good your product is, no matter how much better you may be at the, the, the core part of your business and your competitors, it's about people. If you have great people, you can solve any problem. If you don't have great people, it's obviously a challenge. So, you know, the challenge for us in 2014 and 16, 15 and 16 and even 17 was most of the real talented folks who now want to be in this business, <coughs> excuse me, wouldn't even have a cup of coffee with me, let alone come to work. Why is that? Uh, because they couldn't take the chance of being involved in this Ill federally illegal business. <laughs> so, you know, we have... Later on, we've been able to add a CMO who came to us from Kimberly Clark, who's done terrific things with our whole marketing organization. Um, a number of other marketing folks who've come from all kinds of very, very well-known CPG companies. Uh, a guy who runs capital markets for us came from a very storied hedge fund business. Um, you know, our, our retail business is now run by a former Abercrombie & Fitch um, executive who's terrific and has brought in like super talented former Nordstrom managers, former, like real talent who know how to run each of the particular things they know how to do. When we started in 14, 15, and 16, you know, no exaggeration, the only people that would work for us were people who were lifelong flag-waving cannabis activists who were super passionate, but they came with all of the challenges that you could imagine for people who were, whose most important focus every day was, was cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one thing, um, the partner walked in your door and what opportunity did you see? What did the person say to you? Because they had convinced you of the opportunity also. Well, right? you know, my partner, you know, my partner, Matt Darren, who has been one of my two real estate partners uh, for, you know, 15 plus years, uh, walked in my office. He's substantially younger than I am. So he was a bit more connected to that culture than I was, I'd say. Um, well, you also went to Madison, so you're pretty connected to the culture. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> a long time ago, though. Right. A long time ago. Um, but, but you know, he came in my office and said, you know, I got a bunch of friends in California. They're doing this. They're making a lot of money. And they just passed this law in Illinois. We should do this. And ultimately, what what we looked at was this was an opportunity to really start an industry, not just a business, but start an entire industry from the ground floor. And, and that was certainly intriguing. And, and, you know, one story you may have seen me talk about, but, um, you know, I grew up in a house in, in suburbs of Milwaukee where, um, where my dad looked at me when I was in high school and said, you don't ever have to worry if I, you know, about the cops finding marijuana, if you have it, because if I find it, I'm calling them myself, myself. And right. I believe, and I truly believed he would do it. Um, so when we kind of started down this road in early 14, um, I sat down with him and said, we're thinking about this. What do you think? Knowing, at least expecting what I would have expected him to say. And he looked at me and he said, you know, if you can find something that helps my arthritis, I'm in. Hmm. And it was one of those moments and it's, you know, it's kind of a cute story, but it's one of those moments where I looked around and truly said, if he's changing his view on this, the entire world's going to change their mind. And it really has played out. It played out much faster than we really thought it would play out. But that is exactly how it played out. And, and truly one of my, uh, one of my only real regrets in this business is that he's not here to see. Mm. How this has played out. Sorry to hear that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, but it, it's, uh, it feels a real it, need for people. 
it does. It, it, you know, the, the, the medical side of this, of this business, in my opinion, and the, 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 the moral discussion around the medical side, I think is, is really a no brainer. Um, regardless of what you think about the adult use side of the business and people have different perspectives for sure. Uh, there is zero question that this helps people. Um, and it, it helps people with a lot of various different issues. So it is without question a medicine and it can definitely help people. Yeah. You know, we've gone from when we started looking at this in 2014, the acceptance rate kind of for the medical programs around the country was somewhere about 50% nationally, maybe less than that. Today it's 85, 90% of the public supports the medical programs. When you get to the adult use side, it's obviously different. There are, there are people who have very strong views. I think those percentages still are also somewhere, you know, 60, 65% of the public now is supportive of, or more is supportive of, you know, adult use legalization. Um, but, uh, but that's a, that is, you know, admittedly, that's a much tougher conversation for sure. Yeah. You know, Mitch, I don't know if this is a unique perspective, but, um, I know it's, it's, uh, an interesting perspective as far as you think of the business as four separate businesses, which is like farming, manufacturing, retail, and brand, which is cool the way you think about it. And I wanted to just talk about the retail side because you took a little bit different approach to the retail side, I think, than, than most people took. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think both of both the things you said are true. I, I, you know, we do really think of this as four very distinct businesses. Um, you know, we have people who run each of those businesses. And are most people think about them. it like you, would you say in the industry or no? I'd say people are, are beginning to get there to some degree. Hmm. The great majority of people in the industry um, are in only one or two of those lines of businesses, what we call the, the MSOs, which are what, one of the, the monikers they put on us and some of the other big guys, multi-state operators. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we are vertical. We are really in all four of those businesses. Um, but, but I think it's, I think it's the way you have to think about the business. I think the real success is going to come both from running each of those businesses very, very well, but then figuring out how to take advantage of the fact you are vertically integrated and yeah. making sure you don't, you don't lose sight of the fact that you got to connect those pieces. Yeah. Cause in this uh, situation, it allows you to control the whole supply chain. Is that, it's critically important, and you're going to see that here. Um, you know, we see it in in places like Pennsylvania and Illinois today, where there are beginning to be very substantial product shortages, um, which we're not immune to, and we're suffering from them. But the folks like us who are vertically integrated have much more control, both in terms of our own supply, but we also have supply that we can um, provide to others, and therefore make sure we get supply from them at the same time. So. You know, I think you're going to see that. You're going to see Illinois, unfortunately, and I'm not saying anything people haven't said a lot of in the last month or two, you're going to see massive product shortages in Illinois for the first six to 12 months of the adult use program. And, you know, to be a standalone dispensary, for example, without, <coughs> excuse me, without connection to a cultivation and production facility is going to be a very, very scary thing for those folks who are in that. Does that business. mean prices will go up a lot or what does that mean for the consumer? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I do think there's certainly a risk that there will be price increases. Um, yeah. You know, if it's a pure supply. So go to their dispensaries equation, now and buy as much as humanly possible. <laughs> there, there's actually shortages today already. Really? Just with, just with the medical patients. Um, you know, one of the really unique things about Illinois' law is that it requires both the cultivators, producers, and retailers to ensure that the supply of the, the existing medical patient does not decrease. Mm. So nothing can be sold to the adult use, <coughs> excuse me, to the adult use side of the business until the medical patients have at least as much as we were providing to them before. Mm. So it, you know it's going to be a challenging few months for everybody in the business, no question about it. I do think you will see certain people raise prices. Um, if it's a pure supply and demand equation, prices will go up. I think you know we're still evaluating how we're going to react to that, um, but yeah. but I think. You know, I think we're very focused on making sure we have great product to supply our customers and we're not as focused, quite frankly, on what those prices look like. Yeah. What's, what have you done um, on the retail side that's been unique? And uh, maybe talk about early on and then now that you have some, what are some changes that were made based on you've had some true, like people have run large retail chains come in. I'm curious of what they revamped or changed or left the same. <coughs> So, you know, one of the things that we set out to do was to make our 
facilities, a kind of a wellness facility, mm-hmm. not just, you know, not just the Burger King of, of cannabis stores, if you will. You know, we never wanted this to be stand in line, stand in a queue, get to the front, order your sandwich, you know, order your eighth and go home. Um, obviously, there's a part of that that has to be that way. But we really want to treat and, and very much focus on the medical side of treating the whole patient. So we've had um, wellness activities for our patients on a regular basis. We've had support groups for our patients on a regular basis. Um, and and we aim to continue that in the new uh, you know, in the new adult use world, um, it's going to be more challenging, quite frankly, because the great majority of folks in and out of the door are not really going to be focused on those things. So it's going to, it's going to have to morph to make sure we address what our customers and patients want. Mm-hmm. That, that said, it's been my proposition from day one that the great majority of adult use folks are really treating the same things, the same conditions, the same issues that the medical patients are more like self-medicating type of situation. Well, well, you know, they don't have, they, they may or may not have a condition that would have allowed them to get a card. But if you look at the core of what people use cannabis for, they use it for three or four or five very distinct things. They use it to help sleep. They use it to help with pain. They use it to relax. Like that's, that's pretty much what 90% of the people mm-hmm. that use cannabis use it for, whether it's purely recreational or whether it is medicinal or it's somewhere in between. And, and um, right. you know, I read it, you know, there was a book written by one of the very early on pioneers in this business that talked about that. And it really helped shape my perspective of kind of how we looked at this business and how we tried to add a wellness component to it. And frankly, how we're going to keep continuing to do that because I think it's really important. And I think that, um, you know, whether, you know, look, if you have trouble sleeping, that isn't enough to get you a medical card in hardly any state. Um, if you have serious anxiety, that is not enough to get you a card in almost any state. But you can use cannabis the same way somebody can if they have a condition that does allow them to get a card. So it, it's, uh, you know, I think it is... Uh, um, you know, we're excited about the adult use in Illinois. We're excited to have it spread to other states. I think Pennsylvania, we hope, will be one of the newer states that comes on in the next year or two. And, <coughs> and you know, Maryland, hopefully shortly thereafter. And, you know, we're excited about it. So, Mitch, what did the, some of the experts in retail come in and thought you were doing well? And what did they add on? Well, you know, what, what, what the retail folks, you know, retail guys come kind of in, in a bunch of shapes and sizes, mm-hmm. but pretty, pretty much they are either merchants or they're operators, right? They're either focused on understanding the product, merchandising the product, making sure you have the right selections, mm-hmm. or they're focused on operations. And, and, and you know, I think on the, the product side, we're in pretty good shape. I think, you know, they've done one thing in particular for us. We've begun to, to really think about the business like normal retail guys do. Like you have an assortment, you don't need 50 strains, you need, you know, 15. And to kind of find the way to provide the right product to our customers and do it in a very efficient, effective, and consistent way. When you have 50 strains that you buy from 10 different people, it's hard to be consistent. Mm. I think the biggest thing that those folks have brought us is on the operational side. And, you know, we're going, for example, in Illinois from seeing at our busiest dispensary, you know, 120 or 30 patients a day Mm. to, you know, which by the way, you go back to the first week we were open in that store where we saw, you know, five people a day, Uh, you know, that's been a, a very nice, slow, steady, but significant growth that has caused us challenges along the way for sure. But, you know, now we're going to go from seeing 100, you know, 100 to 130 patients a day to 500, 600, 800 hmm. patients a day. So, you know, how do you get them like, through like operationally, you know, the flow so, of the people? Exactly. So, you know, not to sound like a manufacturing guy, but throughput is a big focus for us right yeah. now without losing customer touch right. because because at the end of the day um i'd rather serve you know 500 customers well than 700 customers poorly yeah. so you know so we have to find a way to make sure that um you know we have so many different kinds of patients one of the fascinating things on the retail side of the business to me there's almost no retail business i can think of that serves the 
breadth and depth of customer base we do. Literally everybody from 21 to 90, no, no, you know, male, It, it creates female. problems probably streamlining things because you're not you're serving such a range of customer. Well, it does. And it, it, it's a challenge from marketing perspective, both from the legal side, what we're allowed to do, but even beyond that, you know, to target your customers and in, in the social media world that everybody's in, I know you're very familiar with, you know, you got to target your customers, right? Uh, so it's harder to do here because it literally is 21 to 90 plus it's male, female across every economic spectrum, across every social spectrum, across every, um, I mean, everything you can think of. There, there is no, you know, the only the only people who don't come in is that small group of, you know, of conservative folks who don't think this is a good thing. But literally, other than that, it can be anybody and everybody. So, but that's one of the great things about it is that that's what keeps it fun and interesting for our people. But but if you think about it, we have folks who want to pre-order. We have a great pre-order system in our stores. So they can go online, they can pre-order. They can't buy it online, but they can pre-order. We have, uh, you know, fast lanes, like the fast pass at Disney. Mm -hmm. We have fast lanes where they can come in, having pre-ordered, literally be in and out of the store in yeah. less than five minutes. Yeah. And there are, there are other people who want to kind of wander around, look around, and then when they want to buy something, they want to go up to the counter, buy it, and get out quickly. There are other people who, quite frankly, want to spend an hour talking to somebody. And right. it's important to us that we have... We have an we have a, a a system that allows for all of those things. Yeah, Mitch, you probably Graham never dreamed this is what you'd be doing. It just seems like just I get stressed thinking about all these components, and we're just talking about the retail side. We're not even talking about sure. the farming, manufacturing, the brand side. Um, what did the young Mitch want to do? What what did you want to do? When you grew up, uh, you know, like the real young Mitch. I don't know, probably be a you know a fireman or something, but. Uh, you know, I think the, 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 the young Mitch probably wanted to be an NFL football player, mm. but that, you know, but that ended quickly when, you know, I realized I couldn't really run that fast. I didn't want to get hit, I didn't want to get hit that much anymore. Um, what did your you know, dad do? My dad was, uh, was an accountant and was mm -hmm. involved in various consulting and business activities through his whole life. Um, you know, I think, you know, what did I want to do as I started my career? You know, I was an accountant by education, a lawyer mm -hmm. by education, practiced law for a while. I've was, was been in the real estate business a long time. So I, I had an entrepreneurial streak mm -hmm. in me, I think. But, um, you know, the funny thing is if you went back and talked to people I grew up with or people I went to high school with and said, you know, who's the person you know who's least likely to be in the cannabis business? I probably would have been on that list. <laughs> um, it was just not part of my culture, my DNA. It's just not what I, I mean. It just not in a million years that I think I would do this. And, and, and quite frankly, but for having, uh, having the partner that I did and do, um, I probably wouldn't have done, you know, we probably wouldn't have done this. So it's, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's part of the great, the great joy of life in a lot of ways is, is, you know, you make decisions. Everybody does every single day and it, you know, it kind of leads you on a winding path. The key ultimate to success, I think, is being able to, when you happen to find those opportunities by accident, because most people, frankly, find them by accident, you got to know it and you got to know how to how to take advantage of it and, and do your best to kind of create something out of it. But, yeah. But this was, th this was not a long drawn plan, I can assure you of that. How did you meet, you know, I know you had a core, a great core <clears throat> team going into starting this. How did you meet um, your partners? So both. Yeah, Matt, Darren, and Josh Joseph, who's uh, the three of us have been partners and frontline real estate partners for, I don't know, 13 or 14 years now. Um, and uh, both Josh and Matt worked for me. Josh was the first guy I hired when I was at Hilco Real Estate. Mm -hmm. I was the founder of a business called Hilco Real Estate, kind of in the distressed real estate world. Mm -hmm. um, Josh was the first guy I hired. And uh, uh, Matt was a longtime family friend of Josh, really Josh's brother. And so he came to work for us. And then I, I ultimately left Frontline in a uh, wonderful time of the world. Uh, I left in, uh, in uh, 08, in the middle of the Chaos. disaster. Right, yeah. the disaster, And then about 14 months later, <clears throat> they, they left and joined me and we started Frontline together. Hmm. What are some of the challenges people outside the industry don't see 
Like I think like one thing that stresses me out about thinking what you do is like just the security alone is probably daunting. Like how heavy well, does the security have to be? Because uh, people right now they can't they have to pay cash, right? Or is that is that it is in most states in all of our states it is a cash business today. Yeah. Um, but you know, our, our, listen, the security issues are very, very, very tightly put together. Um, we have great systems to deal with it. Um, you know, it's certainly a concern every day. Worry would be way too strong of a statement in the, mm-hmm. in the scheme of the hundred things on our list to worry about. That's not terribly high on the list because it, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it functions very nicely. You know, the biggest, the biggest challenge in the business other than people and, you know, anytime you talk to anybody who has a business like we do again, four separate business lines, you know, think about this for a moment, right? Four separate businesses across 11 states, all startups. So sounds, you know, terrible. No, so kidding. we had no, we had no infrastructure. I, you know, one of the easy ways to think about it, my mm-hmm. retail team, we hired, we hired just a terrific head of retail came to us from Abercrombie among a bunch of other places. Um, she joined us just about a year ago. We had no retail team. I mean, the guys running the retail business were Matt and I, and, you know, two young people who were cannabis people who were great, who are still with us who never had retail experience before in their lives. And we were running the retail business. Like, what the heck did we know? And, you know, I've been involved in the retail business before, which helped a little. But, um, you know, she came in and built, and literally in one year, built an entire team, built a you know, great number two, regional managers, district managers, store managers. Mm-hmm. We've replaced a bunch of our store managers who, you know, some have been able to kind of make the transition from kind of uh, the old school, you know, dispensary to a real professional business. And, um, you know, so, so the, just the, the transitions have certainly been, been a real challenge and, and uh, um, but it, it's, it has been, uh, it's been a heck of a ride. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, the, what you do is very capital intensive. I think you said somewhere like it's $12 million minimum to outfit a building. Right. Yeah. So yeah. a part of your job was also to raise capital. Right. Talk about that process because that's a whole separate job in itself. It was, and that was a significant part of my job. Um, and we, you know, we collectively, you know, we think that we certainly thought a lot like real estate guys. So when we started, we we started in Illinois. We raised money for three stores in Illinois. Not a big deal. We had some initial initial real estate investors. We raised. I don't know four or $5 million. I say that like flippantly, but yeah. uh, it was actually, you know, we had three or four guys who were very committed, mm-hmm. loved it. You know, been involved in the real estate business with us. Um, they were kind of bummed. We didn't get more. We didn't get a cultivation facility. Um, we then won Maryland. So we raised some money in Maryland. We then bought a grow facility in Illinois. So we raised money for that about 10 million bucks. Uh, and we, then we won Pennsylvania. We run six dispensaries initially and um and a grow facility now we have to raise real money and we raised a good chunk of it and then like stupid people that we were we started building our cultivation but bought us three and a half million dollar building started building our cultivation building and halfway through the building we kind of realized we ran out of money um so we literally had to put construction on hold for a little while Mm. without anybody knowing because you didn't want to alarm our, you know, the whole industry, our whole team. Um, but it was among the most stressful days I've had for sure. Uh, we ultimately were able to raise the rest of it, get things going. Shockingly, our contractor wasn't very excited when we told him he wasn't going to get paid for a while, but everybody kind of rolled with the punches as best we could. And, um, you know, we raised through most of our state by state expansions, Illinois, Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, uh, and then Ohio, and North Dakota, we raised kind of state by state. And we raised a total of about uh, uh, seventy-five million dollars, I think, um, in in smaller chunks. Uh-huh. Um, but it was it was a full time job, and it was uh, it was one of the things we were good at in the real estate business. We had a lot of relationships, but this this stretched it to a great degree, and it got much much easier as it went on because the first, you know. Illinois was easy. After that, Maryland and Pennsylvania were a challenge for sure because there just weren't that many people who thought it was okay. They all, everybody was intrigued, but people were not excited about it. I have a longtime friend in relationship who was involved in a different business with me that, that's a, 
um, you know, a, a theoretically reputationally challenging business um, that he's involved in. And he's like, I, I can't do this. It, would, it would, could affect my, 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 you know, status and my, you know, people think of me. And this is someone who is, who is uh, a, you know, a, a fan of the product, put it that way. So, mm. um, but there's so a stigma it, you know, that comes with it. There certainly was. I think there still is, but it's it's much, much, much reduced. You know, we then, <coughs> we took all of our state entities <coughs> late last year, rolled them up into one corporate entity as we looked at, we looked at the roadmap ahead of us and said, if we're going to do, you know, if we're going to become a real company as opposed to just a collection of deals, if you will, we have to make one entity, we have to put it all together, we have to be able to go raise capital collectively as one entity. And it set us up to be able to do a public offering or the deal we ultimately did with CureLeaf. Uh, so we went out uh, just about this time last year in the worst cannabis market we could imagine in December. And then ultimately got better in January. We raised about $90 million. Uh, we closed in early March, uh, which really allowed us to uh, kind, of, uh, kind of finish the expansion we needed to finish, gave us the capital to do what we needed to do. Um, we then obviously did the deal with, with Cureleaf. And then subsequent to that, we are now executing a number of sale leaseback transactions. You know, we're a moment in time in the cannabis world because the public cannabis stocks have been so challenged um, in large measure because there just isn't – U.S. institutions can't own the stocks today, which is really unfortunate. Mm. Uh, because of that, there's weakness in the cannabis public markets, even though the businesses actually are stronger than they've ever been. Uh, so the, the fundraising capability is very tough right now. So we're doing it through sale leasebacks. We were, we probably owned more, more real estate. We're real estate guys. We were comfortable owning real estate. We probably owned more real estate than anybody in the space. Mm. So we're able to, we're, you know, we're able to do very, very good sale leaseback transactions, mm. which will give us the money to kind of finish the expansion we're doing in Illinois. We're taking the rest of our facility in Illinois and yeah. quadrupling the capacity, doing the same in Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah. it's, uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, I love you talking about this because it's like that overnight success after 20 plus years, right? I mean, your real estate <laughs> experience was so valuable for this whole process, you know? You know it was. Even your connections were valuable from your well, path, you know, from the real estate side. We couldn't have done the first couple states without our relationships, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so th those relationships are, are what got us the capital and, and having a successful real estate track record having, you know, taking people's money as investors and providing good returns to them allowed us to do this. Right. Beyond that though, just having business experience and relationships with other folks who could give us perspective when we needed it, um, I think allowed us to grow fast enough without mm -hmm. doing too many, without doing too many stupid things. Right. You know, and, and look, you're seeing right now some of the super fast growing cannabis businesses out there get caught having done some some really aggressive things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the people for a second, because I know that that is a huge value to you. It's, it's what grows the company, what you find the most valuable thing. Um, and wondering what in your, your, you have eight over 800 staff right now. Um, what's like the hiring and training process look like? What, how do you, I want to get a sense of how we can learn from you about leading leadership. Well, the hiring training process for our first stores was we hired them. We <laughs> threw them to the walls. Trained, no. Well, we, we, we actually thought we were training them for four hours and then we said, go do your thing. And it was, uh, you know, it was a mess. Um, but you know, we got through it and, and you know, the funny part of it is Matt and I were basically the assistant managers in our first two stores in part because we were too cheap to hire an assistant manager and we weren't making any money, obviously. And we were also too, um, too controlling probably to not be there all the time. The real positive is it gave us a real perspective every minute of every day of what mm. happens in those stores on a retail basis. We didn't quite have the same experience on the grow side because you can't, it's a little bit different obviously, but it really helped us, I think, understand the retail business. And, you know, for better or worse, unfortunately, I just can't, I don't have the time to spend much time in the stores today. We have other things we have to do. Um, so, you know, tra training today, again, you know, it's, it's all about people, Jeremy. It is, um, as you bring in more and more quality people, you can do more and more things. So we now have a 
full-blown retail training department. We have an HR group that helps with that. But our, you know, our real, uh, you know, our, our retail operations team really has built just a terrific training module and um, doing some of it in person, some of it online. Um, it, it, it's it's like everything else in the business. It 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 is the the head and shoulders most important asset in this business is not capital, it's human capital. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. no matter how much money you have, no matter how, again, no matter how good your product is, if you don't have the right people, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, for, and, you know, my advice to anybody yeah. who's in a, you know, as you're starting a business and, you know, we had, we had constraints that wouldn't allow us to do this. One great people really wouldn't come work for us for the most part. Mm. And two, we couldn't afford to pay them, but, but my advice to people, and I, you know, I do spend some time and probably will in the future spend more time talking to people about their businesses. Okay. Like find a way somehow, some way to always hire, you know, if you're, you're trying to choose between the kind of cheaper person and you think they're going to be okay and you can't really afford any more than that, figure out a way to step up and hire the more, you know, the better person. It's almost always worth it. Almost always. Yeah. What is your, what kind of advice do you have as far as leadership goes, you know, growing a 800 plus person company and, and kind of getting the mission out there? What, what, where do you spend your time as far as, you know, leading the, the, the company and what do you do? Well, it's, it, it, you know, you know, I think leading is a, is a multifaceted exercise. It really is. I think it is a full, I mean, it really is a full-time job. Unfortunately, it can't be quite a full-time job. Right. Um, you know, part of the way I think great leaders lead is they lead by example, first mm-hmm. of all. Right. So it, it, you know, both Matt and myself, uh, you know, we're the first, the first person I wouldn't say in every morning, but we're the first person, you know, working every morning or we're the last person there at night most days. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to demean anything anybody else is doing, but you know, I, I would never expect anybody to work any harder than we're willing to work. To me, that's part of it. But I think, you know, I think a lot of it is, is, is really focusing on leadership. And I, you know, for whatever it's worth, I spent a lot of time, you know, reading different books, understanding different mm-hmm. tools. Experience certainly helps. Um, it, it, it's, you're dealing with a lot of personalities. You're yeah. dealing with a lot of, a lot of super passionate people. Um, but I think, setting a mission and setting goals and setting company values, which we did very, very early on. Hmm. We have a part, we have a partner in the business who runs our Maryland and Pennsylvania operation. Very, very critical in, in helping us kind of set those initial goals and values for the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has sustained us to this day. And I think, I think one of the things we talk about all the time is if, you know, if, when there were two of us or there were even 10 or 15 of us, it's easy to make sure people are making the right decision because quite frankly, Matt and I made every major decision. When we started, I mean, when we needed a new design for t-shirts, you know, he called his buddy the designer and we designed him and we called someone else and, and, I, and I went and picked him up and brought him to the store. So I, I mean, we made every decision in the business. Right. When, when you get to a place where there's, 800, where there's 800 employees, you know, how do you expect employee number 801 to right. make the right decisions? Right. You know, part of it's training. Part of it for sure is oversight and making sure, but a lot of it is instilling mm. values in the people core values. So, they un- so they understand mm. how to make decisions. And, you know, part of, part of learning that is also, um, you know, it's a bit of the, you know, the old story of putting your hand on the stove, right? Like, you know, you can yell at people all you want, which, you know, if you talk to people earlier in my career, I've probably been accused of that now and then um, it doesn't work. It just doesn't, it's not, it, it's not helpful. It's not successful. You got to let people, you got to give people guidance. You got to let them make decisions. They're going to make mistakes and you got to figure out a way to correct those mistakes, point them out, work on them without causing people to, you know, to run away and feel bad about themselves. And, mm-hmm. and that's, it's super challenging. It is not easy. What were some of the values or maybe one of the values we should think about that you kind of, it's like almost like a decision making process they probably think of the values on and you know compare it to the decision they're making what were some of the values you came up with or that the other staff member came up with well no it was it was really an an iterative process that we Mm -hmm. all 
worked on together. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I had, I, I think I don't have it sitting in front of me. If we're in my office, I actually have it sitting on the wall in my office. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it crosses every spectrum. It, it's, you know, there were values about, you know, making sure we had the best product. It, there were values about, um, you know, kind of, you know, I, you know, the best way I can put it is, is, you know, to me, the most important value was, was essentially, um, you know, do unto others as you do unto yourself, you know, kind of the, 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 the point being, um, don't do anything that you would be embarrassed to have be on the front page of the newspaper. Mm -hmm, right. I, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's one of the guiding principles you, you really want people to think about every phone call they have, every email they send. Um, you know, we've all been involved in a way that, you know, the, the, the digital world will involve, you know, that we're involved in today, Jeremy, you send an email, it lasts forever. And, uh, I, I expect almost everybody has seen emails that people there, they know people they work with people that send and you kind of let's say like, that's, you know, how on earth did somebody send that? You know, you got to think long and hard about those things and you got to think about how you treat your other people, you know, treating people with respect super important in our, in our, in our culture, even when you have people doing incredibly stupid things, because people do dumb things every day. We all do, but it, it, it's about how do you, how do you treat people with, with, with respect? How do you try to um, treat them as partners? So a lot of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's been, it really was critically important to us as we began. And it's even at, it's more critical today. It's evolving. We're continuing to do more and more different things with them. Uh, but, uh, and, and frankly, they're also evolving now into, uh, a process of, uh, of, of things we call OKRs, which are, uh, um, you know, a, a different way of kind of setting objectives and key results mm -hmm. from those objectives. And, uh, you know, it's been a, been a very effective tool for us. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you mentioned books. Um, what are some of the favorite books people should check out? Um, <laughs> um uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to necessarily point to any particular ones i think you know i, I guess what say, I, I'm, I'm my audible cue is is at zero right now so i need your suggestions <laughs> <laughs> um I, you know what i would tell you is i think there are a ton of great business and leadership books out there a ton and i've probably read a hundred of them um you know most of the guys who work with me are scared when I go away on Christmas break because I end up always coming back charged up about some and I go buy a bunch right. and give them to everybody. You know, good to great is certainly on. I'm, I don't know. I don't know if you've read that. It's, yeah, you know, totally. It's a, yeah. It's a, Jim Collins. It's a, yeah. It's a, a long term bestseller. Um, there's a book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which I actually think is a terrific yeah. book. Patrick Lencioni. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, the, 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 the OKR book and I, the, the title frankly, yeah, John Dor or John Dor, I forgot his Correct. name. Yeah. Dor yeah. Doherty maybe. Dorn, yeah. I think he, I forget his he, name. you think he like advised Google, right? Or a bunch of different companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it actually was a, was a, um, you know, life changing would be a strong statement, but it was a very, very influential book to me. I, I read it just about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, uh, to me, one of the biggest insights in that book is as you set objectives, they have to be measurable. And I think one of the things we all fall into, everybody, is, you know, you set goals and objectives. Every company has, has some version of this as you get bigger. Yeah. Um, and unless they're measurable, it's hard, to, it, it's hard to hold people accountable to them. Yeah. You know, they try hard. You kind of did okay. Measurable goals. And by the way, achieving 60%, 70% of them can be a great result. You don't have to, like, it's not a failure if you don't get to a hundred percent. I think a lot of those kinds of things have been important to us. It's been, you know, one of our biggest challenges for at least finding the time to do that stuff as we're racing out of miles an hour to do all the things we're doing. Right. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's measure what matters. OKR is a simple idea. Exactly. 10x growth. It's by John Doerr, D O E R R, for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, it's, a, it's a great book. It is yeah. a great book. And, and again, there's a host of others. Yeah. You know, the two minute manager or whatever. I, you know, there's, there's, I mean, there's a, you know, I think that there's certainly plenty of ones that aren't so good. But if you, you know, honestly, if you go to Amazon and you just look around at leadership mm -hmm. books, 
you almost can't make a mistake if you go to the highly rated books. Yeah. They all offer you something different. They all make you, to, to me, the single thing they do the mo- that's most important is they make you think. Yeah. And the more you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about leadership and you're thinking about how to, how to motivate people, um, that's, that's half the battle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, Mitch, so I always ask this Inspired Insider um, two questions. One, what's been a low moment, a huge challenge that you had to overcome? And on the flip side, what's been a really proud moment from all the stress and tough challenges that you have to fight through with the business? What's been um, a low moment that you can share and how you kind of push through? Well, you know, I'll give you a couple, I guess. First one I mentioned earlier. I mean, when we got to the point in Pennsylvania where we ran out of money and couldn't pay our contractor, um, it was a pretty low moment. Contractor happens to be a friend of mine, which some people might think that made it easier. It actually made it much more difficult. Um, That was a challenge. That was a moment where we were looking at ourselves saying, are we going to actually fail? Um, So that was certainly a low moment. I think the other low moment for us in many regards was as, you know, we started in the dispensary side only. It took us a while to kind of get our legs and and kind of grow in a more logical way, which I think was better for us long term. But as we turned around, we weren't grown up enough yet to do, to go public. And as we saw folks like MedMen and GTI and Cresco and some of our friends, frankly, I mean, most of our friends, um, go public and get lots of accolades and have values through the moon. Um, in some ways, you could think that would be a great thing, but it actually was a low moment for for me and for our team. It kind of felt like we just didn't get there fast enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, um, you know, in many regards, people will say, well, the highest moment has to be the day you signed the deal. Um, the truth is not really. I mean, it, it, it was... Um, the value of our company was there, uh, whether we did it through a public offering, this transaction, other transactions, like we had created that value. Um, it's certainly nice to have that, you know, have someone else agree that you created that value. And, it's like a validation. And, uh, yeah. You know, it is. It is a validation. On the other hand, listen, it is, you know, mostly a stock transaction. So we're in it for the long term. And we think what we did is, is, the, is, is a frankly, a better, better, much better solution for the company and for the business long-term to create that long-term value, which is what I'm in it for, what my partners are in it for. Um, But I think to me, in a lot of ways, the best moments have been as we've been able to attract the best talent we've been able Mm. to attract to get, to get somebody come work for us who was the, you know, who came from a very senior position at Kimberly Clark, who had, who had the experience from Abercrombie and Fitch and Petco and a couple other places to, to kind of like, to me, that was in a lot of ways, the most validation. Hmm. Um, Attracting again, the I, top know, talent. To me, that's, it's a funny thing. Like that's way more validating than going to raise money from investors, hmm. which I know for most people, it should be the opposite. Uh, and it certainly was a good thing. We take them, you know, we take our investors very, very seriously, obviously. And um, that was a huge lift and a, great result to raise $90 million at that point in, in the cycle of this world. And, um, but, but it was, uh, that has really been one of the high points for me. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we're going to have, pl- you know, plenty more to come even as we get this transaction done and uh, as the business kind of gets to the next phase. Yeah. Mitch, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for sharing your, your leadership knowledge, your business knowledge. Um, I know you're up late, you're up early, and you have a busy day, so I really do appreciate it. Where should we point people towards online to check out? I know grassrootscannabis.com. Uh, where yep. else should we point people to just check out your, your business and maybe they're interested in, in going to one of the facilities? Um, where should we point people to? Well, I think that's the best place to start. The website, as you said, uh, grassrootscannabis.com, is that that will take you everywhere you need to be. Obviously, we have a a uh, you know an Instagram page and a uh, you know and a Twitter feed or handle or whatever the heck it is. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I think the website is you know website's the best place to start. 
Um, you know, if people are looking to talk to us about job opportunities, obviously you can do that through the website. It'll tell you where all our dispensaries are, give you a little mm-hmm. insight into what's going on in the company. Um, you know, we probably, use it as an edu- yeah. Um, what, uh, what are you looking to hire for now? Um, uh, there's probably 30 openings on our website. Okay. It's a, it literally is a nonstop job, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> for our HR folks. Um, you know, our, our, our corporate team is pretty built out at the moment. We're, we're continuing to look to do different things. We're, we're just, we've been on a one year, uh, exercise of building best in class data ana- analytics, which is, we think going to separate us from a lot of other guys in the business. Uh, we're excited about that for us and then for the combined company. It really is best in class. No one has anything close to it. So we're now just beginning to do that. So we're going to ultimately go look for some data scientists, folks hmm. to come work for us. Um, but we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're hiring all kinds of different people. A lot of folks in the field, obviously, as we build out new facilities in places like North Dakota, Arkansas, Oklahoma, more mm-hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania. So it's, uh, right. it's a, you know, it's a, there's a lot going on. Check out grassrootscannabis.com. Thanks again, Mitch. Thank you, Jeremy. Really appreciate the time. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.